there and welcome back to my YouTube channel or welcome to my YouTube channel if it's your first time here. I am Sammy Hall and today we talk about another mystery while well, I paint. I very cleverly called it paint and mystery. Today we are talking about a case that is super bloody weird. Ever since I read about it a couple of years ago, it wasn't able to leave my head because it's in there now and it's not going anywhere. So I thought I'd tell you about it. Today we talk about the Diaclov boss incident, which um, was an incident that happened on the Diaclov boss. <laughs> anyway, let's jump into the video, shall we? So back in January of 1959, so a long time ago, a group of experienced hikers set off to do a expedition on the Ural Mountains. Um, as I said, they were all very experienced. This wasn't like a fun trip for them. It was, they were taking it seriously. They left cigarettes and alcohol behind. They were mostly students and they were fit and young and ready for this action. The people in this group kept extensive diaries and that is where we get most of our information. So they wrote everything down in diaries. They took pictures, etc, etc. The leader of the group and the most experienced out of the ten was named Igor Dyatlov and that is what the pass where the incident happened was called after. Dyatlov pass. Igor Dyatlov. You get it. You know what I'm saying. So like I said, there was ten people in this... Um, Just let me put this on silent. Hold on. Just hold on for a second. Mute. It's muted. Anyway, so like I said, there was 10 people who joined this expedition. And um, I have to warn you beforehand and before we go any further. Um, this happened in Russia. And the names of the people are obviously also in Russian. And I'm having a difficult time with pronunciation. I can barely speak English. Okay, so just bear with me. Just relax. It's, it's probably not going to go well, but I'm trying. Alright, so as I said, Igor Dyatlov, he was the leader of the group most experienced in terms of hiking and leadering. You know? So the group consisted of Igor Dyatlov who was the leader of the group and the namesake of the incident. Then there was Zina Kolmogrova, Yuri Doroshenko, who is, he was fearless, you know, when people spoke about him afterwards. It was very, very clear that he was, he did not have a scare bone in his body. You know, he once apparently chased off a bear who was about to attack him and he was like, not to die bear, not in my house. You know, he was that type of lad. Then there was Lud Miller. She was also tough cookie. Tough cookie. Once she was accidentally shot by a hunter or something on one of her hikes. And she just persevered. She was like, I'm not going to make this awkward for anybody. Okay, I got shot a bit, but not a big deal. We'll continue. That's the type of lady she was. Then we have Rustam Slobodin, he was the most athletic of the group, he was very strong, he was like a strong man, you know? Very athletic and the most physically fit of the group. Not that I think the rest of the group wasn't physically fit, but he was next level physically fit, you know? Sasha Kolefatov, I don't know if I butchered that, but whatever, um, he was the cool guy, you know, he didn't appear in many of the photos, he was just like aloof. That's the word I'm looking for. He was aloof. <laughs> then we have Simeon. He was one of the few people who wasn't a student. Uh, just a few weeks before the expedition, he asked if he could join. Um, he wasn't one of the students. None of them really knew him well. But um, he was 37 years old, older than the rest of the group. And they welcomed him with open arms. He had a lot of experience. He was a soldier who fought in World War II. Um, very outdoorsy, so they were happy to have him there, like, just added experience, so, yeah, everyone accepted him into the group very easily. Meow, meow. Always when 
I'm filming, the cat feels the need to pretend like she doesn't get any attention. You know, if you hear her mowing, she's just pretending. Anyway, the next member of the team was Nikolai Tibo. Um, although he was young and also one of the students, he was a very like serious and mature guy. He wasn't the mucking about type. Very mature and serious. You know? You know what I'm saying. You get it. Then we have Yuri. As if you may recall, we have Yuri previously. This is a different Yuri. Um, he was like the funny guy in the group. You know? He was the joker. He always made fun and jokes and nice to have him around. It's it's nice to like mismatch of people. I think it could have been fun. It wasn't, spoiler alert, but you know, it sounds like a really nice group of people. Then we have a third Yuri. I don't know why there's so many Yuris. I'm assuming it's a Russian thing. Yuri Yudin. Um, so very early on in the trip, he began, um, began to suffer a lot with joint pain. He had lots of medical issues and the joint pain became so severe that he had to go back. He had to turn around. He was like, I can't. I'm just going to hold everyone back. I'm in a lot of pain. This is not going to work. Um, what he didn't know at that point is that would end up saving his life, you know. Poor guy. So this Yuri, he was apparently just like a kind and nice guy. He wasn't like a tough macho man type. And the other, the girls in the group really liked him because he was just like a friend, you know. You know the type I'm talking about. Just like a nice guy that's fun to be around. So they were very sad that he couldn't continue with them. Later on, Yuri said, because he's now the only survivor, spoiler alert again, out of the ten, Shane, and he said if he could ask God one question, he would ask what happened to my friends. It's terrible. Poor guy. Yeah, I can't imagine. Anyway, let's move into what actually happened. So, Yuri Yudin went back home, and um, Igor Dyatlov told him, as soon as we get back, we will send a telegram, you know, letting everyone know that we are back and home safely. And then after they were due to return, and they didn't return, everyone got worried and a missing persons report was filed. And a search team was sent out. And what they found, guys, oh, it's not good. I didn't do a disclaimer earlier. Here comes the disclaimer. It might contain some... Uh, things that might be upsetting to people, you know, things like hashtag deceased things, you know, be warned. Anyway, so they sent out the search and the rescue teams and then they came across the hiker's tent. Now, the tent was on top of a slope on this pass and it was cut open from the inside. Alright, so something must have scared the crap out of these experienced hikers for them to tear and cut up their only, like, shelter, you know. So the tent was cut open from the inside. Um, there was a flashlight left on the snow. The skis from the um, hikers were still upright. Uh, the tent poles and stuff were still upright. It's just the blankety part of the tent that was now no longer in tent form, but in laying flat form. You know? And then all of the hikers' food and winter clothing and all that stuff was still inside the tent. They then noticed that there was footsteps heading towards the woods, like down the mountain to the woods. And these footsteps was... They determined from eight to nine people and it, they weren't wearing shoes. They were like barefoot or in socks. The other strange thing is that the footsteps wasn't like sporadic. They weren't running towards the woods or hysterically like trying to get away from something. They were walking very calmly, single file, walking down to the woods. Very odd. Like one second they are cutting up their tent and then the next they are all calmly walking towards the woods without shoes. Weird. Very weird. Anyway, so they followed the footsteps and they came across a big cedar tree. And under the cedar tree 
was the remains of a campfire and also the first two bodies that they discovered. Ugh. It's not good, guys. So the first body they found was of Yuri Doroshenko. He was laying in the snow and he was wearing a short sleeve shirt and swim trunks with one sock. Not exactly winter attire. Never mind winter, this is like snowy, snowy business. It's minus a lot. I can't remember what the temperatures was, but it's cold. It's snowy. It's Russia. You know? So I wouldn't really call this hiking in snow attire. You know? He had burn marks on the side of his head and on his foot as well as minor scrapes and bruises. His official cause of death was ruled hypothermia. You're gonna see a um, pattern rising here. Yuri Krivonyshenko was the second body that was found. Another Yuri, you heard that correctly. He was also found under the cedar tree at the side of this campfire remains. So he was wearing a long sleeve shirt and only one sock. He had burn marks on his foot, legs and hands and um, they found a piece of his knuckle inside his mouth. Which, ooh, I don't think that's what they meant with protein. <laughs> it's not funny, okay? I'm making jokes because, um, you know, it's terrible. It's called the coping mechanism, look it up. Anyway, the cedar tree also had a lot of its branches cut off and they also found traces of skin on the tree so this would appear as if some of the hikers climbed this tree to try and get away from something we don't know what we don't know much but we know we love you <laughs> anyway so that is the first two bodies that was found a couple of days later they found the the next three bodies and this was in between the cedar tree and the tent, you know. Um, that is where they found the next three bodies. Now, according to the way the bodies was found, like the position of the bodies, it seems like they were trying to make their way back to the tent when they died. So the third body that was found was the body of the leader, Igor Dyatlov. He was found face up with his fists clenched and um, also signs of the body being moved post-mortem. He had bruising and abrasions on his ankles and cuts on his face as well as a missing jaw incisor. The injuries he had was consistent with that of a fist fight, you know. His official cause of death was hypothermia. The fourth body that was found was of Zenaida Kolomogrova. She was dressed better than the others, although one of her sweaters had one of the arms ripped off. She had abrasions on her hand and a large bruise on the side of her body that's consistent with being hit by a baton. There was clear signs of a struggle and her death was ruled, her cause of death was ruled hypothermia due to unknown accidents. The autopsy was very vague, you know what I'm saying, like, yes, maybe hypothermia, but that's not the whole story. They don't do a lot of effort to explain the injuries, you know. Like, if you get shot and you don't die on impact and you lay there freezing to death, for example, then it's not just hypothermia, it's you got shot also leading to that. You know what I'm saying? Hypothermia, it doesn't explain the injuries. Anyway. The fifth body that was found was of Ruftem Slobodin. He was found face down, covered with snow. Um, there was internal bleeding in his templates. Templates? 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 Whatever, there. <laughs> he had a large fracture on his skull and there was also signs of the body being moved post-mortem. After this, it would take like more than two months to find the remaining four hikers' bodies. 
Um, a member of the M local Muncie tribe found a makeshift den and it looked like it was like a last attempt for this four hikers to try and survive. They found this den that was created inside the snow and there was tucker, you know, like branches and stuff placed inside the den um, trying to keep themselves warm. Although the bodies was not found inside the den, it was found scattered around the den. This is where the injuries get really bloody weird. Okay. So the sixth body that was found was of Ludmilla. A body was found draped over a natural ledge with water flowing past it. She had missing lips and soft tissue of the face. Her eyes was missing. She had 10 broken ribs, like a major force to the chest area, but no injuries on the outside to indicate the internal injuries. You know what I'm saying? She had massive hemorrhaging of the heart. I guess the force was so hard on the ribs that the ribs pierced the heart. And weirdest thing, she was also missing her tongue. Now they did find blood in her stomach, which would indicate that the tongue was removed while she was still alive. I told you it's not good. <sighs> her official cause of death was massive hemorrhaging to the heart. So that's you know, at least not hypothermia. The next body that was found was of Semyon. You will remember him, he's the guy that's older. The older guy that was like a soldier. He was better dressed for the elements. He was wearing like three pairs of pants and a couple of pairs of socks and two hats and boots. He was more prepared for the elements is what I'm saying. He also had chest injuries, he had five broken ribs and missing soft tissue in the face and also his eyes was missing which I can't imagine that picture well I can, there's pictures on the internet but I won't um, suggest looking it up it's not pretty he also had a large gash on the back of his head his official cause of death you guessed it hypothermia Now both of these people that were found um, had their chest injuries while they were still alive and um, the external injuries did not match the internal injuries. Like it was a massive force that must have caused this um, chest injuries but there was no injuries on the external. You know what I'm saying? So the coroner said the injuries on the inside is equivalent to a fatal car accident. It's so weird. Hypothermia. The eighth body that was found was of Alexander and he had ribs and tears in his clothes and also burn marks on his clothing. He had a broken nose and a deformed neck. Um, likely the neck was snapped. He also had a large gash on the side of his ear. Official cause of death. Hypothermia. The ninth and last body that was found was of Nikolai. Also bruising on the lips and on the face. Internal bleeding in the forearm and a fractured skull. The official cause of death was died of a powerful force, not by other humans. I don't know what that means, but that's the official cause of death. What can I tell you? Now, all of these deaths was highly suspicious. Um, there was traces of radiation found on some of the hikers clothing. The autopsies, the autopsies was very vague, like they didn't do much to try and explain the injuries. Like they just, it's hypothermia, which it probably is. They were not well dressed and they were in minus whatever weather. So probably yes, hypothermia, but what about the injuries? Like, we need explanations for that as well, you know? Anyway, with that, let's get into some of the theories. Now, there are a ton of theories. Way too many to cover on one YouTube video. So, I would suggest che checking it out. Um, it's a very, very, very deep rabbit hole. So, just be warned. But let's go through a couple of theories. So, very early on, one of the 
first theories was that they were killed by the Munsi tribe. So they accidentally stumbled across sacred ground of the Munsi tribe and the Munsi tribe isn't very welcoming to strangers so they killed them. Like this would make sense it this would explain why they single file very calmly walk down the mountain with no shoes and stuff on. If they were being led there at gunpoint or spear point, that would make sense. But what doesn't make sense with this theory is that the tent was cut open from the inside, first of all. Secondly, all of the bodies was found in different places with like widely different injuries. And none of the injuries seemed like, like murder, you know? It doesn't make a ton of sense to me. The Mansi tribe also denied having any involvement. And they also helped to search for the hikers when they went missing. Um, it was actually Mansi tribe that found the last four bodies. Which, I mean, yes, a lot of times... So the actual criminal inserts themselves into the investigation. I know that, but this theory doesn't make sense to me. Oops. I don't know, this theory just doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Also, there was no other foot, footsteps found, like footprints. It was only the eight to nine foot pairs of footsteps found of the actual hikers, you know? There was no... Um, Indication that any other humans were present, you know? I'm not liking this theory a whole lot. It makes not sense to me, personally. The next theory, and this is one that's quite widely accepted for what reason I don't know, but it was that there was an avalanche. This makes absolutely no sense to me. First of all, avalanches aren't very common in the area. And also... There's no indication that an avalanche occurred. The tent wasn't covered in snow. There was a bit of snow above it because it was flattened, but it wasn't covered by snow. The footprints wasn't covered by snow. Like, how would you find footprints if there was an avalanche? Also, why would you find footprints of people all calmly walking into the forest? They weren't running. They were calmly walking without shoes and jackets. Um, I don't know why people like this theory of avalanche because it doesn't make sense. Whatsoever it doesn't make sense. The other thing is, like I said, the skis and the poles and stuff were still upright in the snow. It was just the tent part that they got it open that was flat. So, personally, I don't buy avalanche even, a, even slightly, okay? The third theory in all types of variations is that it's some sort of KGB cover-up, which, I mean, I love a good cover-up. I think they happen every day. So the theories ranges from there was like geologists or something in the area working on something and they made a mistake and then um, they were afraid they're going to get in trouble with the government because, I mean, this is Soviet Russia. This is USSR business. Um, you don't want to get on their bad side. So they covered it up and either accidentally or on purpose killed the hikers. The other parts of this theory goes that two of the members of the team, of the hiking team, was actually undercover KGB agents. But maybe they were even double agents and they also worked for the CIA and they were killed by either party because they were found out to be double agents. You know, um, I don't know. I, I normally I like a good cover up because, as I said, I think it happens a lot. Cover ups happens all the time. But what I'm thinking, like, if this was KGB covering something up, would they not have done a better job of it? Wouldn't they? Why would they make everything so weird so that everyone continues to talk about it forever and ever? You know, it doesn't seem like a human type murder. There's no, I don't know, if they wanted to keep them quiet for whatever reason, then they would have just made them disappear, wouldn't they? I don't know, that's what I'm thinking. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense, this um, cover-up theory. There's not a lot of evidence for it, which I mean, that's probably the point of a cover-up. So I don't know, it's a theory. 
Very nice. Likely. Could be. The next theory is that they were maybe killed by the Yeti. You know the Yeti, the abdominal... 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 Oh man, the snowy Bigfoot one. You know what I'm talking about. Snowy Bigfoot. Um, this is based off one of the photos that um, one of the hikers took. I will insert it here so that you can see what I'm talking about. But a lot of people are saying that looks like a Yeti. But then there's other people saying it just looks like a man in a snowsuit. What do you think? Does it look like a Yeti to you? I mean, I don't know. I don't know about this one. Um, could be the Yeti could be like a get out of my snow. You human people have the whole world to yourself. And then you come and soup nonsense here on my mountain. Get off my snow. I'm tired of you. You know? But I don't know if the Yeti um, would, you know, cover its footprints and do all this weird injuries to people. You would just probably kick them in the face and then they die. I don't know. I haven't met a Yeti, so I don't know what their preferred methods are. Um, so before I don't know more about them, I can't really make judgment. I have nothing against the Yeti. Don't come at me, Yeti. Anyway, this sounds ridiculous, but who knows? Who knows? The whole case is ridiculous, so why not go for ridiculous theories? Speaking of ridiculous theory, the next theory, of course, is aliens. Now, before you roll your eyes and switch off the video, hear me out. First of all, a ton of very well-respected people um, claimed that they saw lights in the sky that evening. Weird balls of lightning. And then they also referred to the last picture that the hikers took. Very last picture. I will also attach it here. It's a very out of um, zoom, what do you call it? Out of focus photo of what appears to be lights. No one can see what's going on there, but you know, people who believe in the whole... Um, Alien theory, they show this picture like this was so important that they took a picture of it in their final moments it would appear, you know. All of the pictures I'm showing is 100% real, it's not fakey photos. Um, so you decide for yourself what you think that is. If the alien theory is correct, right, a lot of things would make sense, let's be honest. First of all, the radiation on the clothing. We don't know their technology. Also, the very strange internal injuries without external injuries backing it up. Again, we don't know the technology. They might have a technology to boost your insides. You know? Also, the burn marks, like, what is that thing? Bzz, a death ray. Am I sounding ridiculous? Maybe, but I'm not ruling anything out. This case is super weird and aliens and yeti makes more sense than a bloody avalanche. I don't understand the avalanche one. It does not make sense. Anyway, the final theory I can tell you about today is that there was balls of lightning that would explain the lights in the sky that everyone reported. But what I don't really like about this theory is that this would suggest that these guys got so scared because of lightning that they cut their tent open and ran into the woods. Because everyone knows when there's lightning, the best place you want to be is under a tree. Yeah, not making sense. Then apparently the hikers climbed one of the trees and held on for dear life. And um, then the lightning hit at the tree and the guys fell out the two guys and that's why they have scrapes and burn marks because of the lightning and then they ash that died then the other four people that was found by the ravine 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 whatever they were standing and the lightning hit at them in the middle of them and it poof, clapped them to hit in two different directions and then that's why they have broken ribs and stuff. It was the force. 
which they say lightning doesn't strike the same place twice, but yeah, apparently it strikes all nine people. Killed by lightning, one shot. Not one shot, three shots. It's not, I'm not liking this theory either. There's not one of these theories that I go, mm-hmm, yep, that's it. Not one. So, um, I'm pretty sure this is going to remain a mystery. Every year there comes new theories or people claiming they've figured it out. But it's so long ago, there's no new evidence that's going to be found. Um, so, it's going to remain a bloody mystery. What do you think happened? I honestly don't know. I can't even lean towards a theory here because none of these theories make sense. You know? Anyway, let me know what you think happened and let me know what story you would like me to cover next week. Okay, if there's something mysterious, interesting, true crime, whatever, let me know what you want me to talk about and I will try to make it happen. Anyway, for now, this is it for Paint and Bloody Mystery and I hope to see you next time. Alright, no, we'll chat again later. Bye bye.